theyeshiva.net. So Miriam, the older sister of Moshe and of Aaron, suffers a condition of what we call today leprosy at the conclusion of Parshas Baha'u'llah. As the Pasuk says, that Miriam becomes Mitzayra as Kashalag. She becomes a Mitzayra, a leper. Her skin turns white as snow. There are patches of whiteness that resemble snow. And according to the laws of leprosy, God tells Moshe that Tisager Shivas Yamim Echutz Lamachana Vaachar Teyasef. She should be quarantined for seven days outside of the camp, outside of the machana, outside of the dwelling place of the Jewish people, and then she will come back. Miriam is quarantined for seven days outside of the camp. Miriam. And the nation did not travel until Miriam returned back to the camp. As we learned in the book of Leviticus, in Parshas Tazriya Metzara, when somebody suffered this condition of tzaras, I'm translating it as leprosy, it's an inaccurate translation, because tzaras was similar to a leprosy in the sense that it was a skin disease, but its symptoms are somewhat different than what we call today a leprosy. We learned in Parshas Tazria when somebody had that condition, they were quarantined until they recovered from it. And then they came back into the camp. So Miriam, who suffers from this condition, needs to remain seven days outside. Then she comes back. So the Pasuk says the nation would not travel as long as she was outside of the camp, until she returns. When she returned, they traveled on to the next location. To a, they were in a place called Chatzeres, and they traveled to the part of the desert called Midbar Paran. Rashi quotes our sages in Sifri and in Mesech Saita. And Rashi says on the words, V'ha'am nasa, the nation did not travel, this was a unique gesture of honor that God conferred upon Miriam. In lieu for that one hour that she remained standing. She remained in one place. She did not move on. When her brother Moshe, baby infant Moshe, when he was three months old, he was cast into the Nile Delta by his mother who knew that he will be abducted and cast into the Nile as most Jewish infants, male infants. So his mother built a box, a teva, a little basket where she placed little Moshe and placed him in the Ya'ir. And what does the Pasuk say in Shmois? His sister Miriam, who was only a little girl, she was six years old, she stood from far, Ledea, to know what will happen with him. She waits for Moshe, she doesn't go home. She stands there and she waits to guard and protect her brother. Now she can't really guard and protect him, she's six years old. What is she supposed to do if an Egyptian soldier comes? But she's there because she's worried about Moshe. She wants to know his whereabouts. She wants to see how things develop. And ultimately, we know the rest of the story. The princess Batya comes to the river to bathe and she retrieves the casket and she ultimately raises Moshe as her child in Pharaoh's palace. Not before Miriam offers her to bring a Hebrew mother, a Jewish mother, to nurse the baby. And... The daughter of Pari is more than happy to bring, uh, what is it called, a wet nurse, right? What do they call it? A wet nurse for a little Moshe. And of course, little Miriam seizes the opportunity to unite mother and baby because Moshe now is being nursed by his real mother who was just a Hebrew woman 
to nurse this baby, so the wet nurse of this baby is the mother of the baby, and it works for everybody. So Rashi says, to honor this gesture that Miriam waited for her baby, Moshe, as he was put into the river, so many decades later, the nation waited for her. As she was quarantined, and she was now outside of the camp because of her condition, nobody moved. They stay put. Just as she didn't move, she stayed put because of her little brother who she cared about. So decades later, the entire nation, Klal Yisrael, also stay put and would not move on until Miriam comes back to the camp. That's what Rashi teaches us, again quoting Maseches Saita, Davtes, and the Sifri. Zeha kavod chalak lohamokam. This was a special kavod, uh, a gesture of honor, of respect, of compensation to Miriam for what she has done for her brother so many decades earlier when they were both so young. Now I want to ask you, I don't mean to be a party pooper, but I want to ask you a klotzkash. You know what a klotzkash is? Anybody knows what a klotzkash is? You know what a klotz is? I don't know how you say a klotzkash in English. A klotz actually means a log, right? Like a piece of wood. A klotzkash is, so to speak, a stupid question. But usually, they're the best questions. <laughs> they're the best questions because they're like the obvious ones. It's the questions that four-year-olds ask and nobody has an answer. So they stop asking those questions. Right? But those are like the best, the best questions. So it's a beautiful Rashi. Miriam was being honored by the entire Jewish nation in a gesture of gratitude, of covet, of respect for what she did to Moshe. Okay, now let's assume she never waited for Moshe. <laughs> let's assume that story never happened. Hypothetically, if it would have never happened. Okay, now let's come to this story. Miriam is a leper. She's quarantined outside of the camp for seven days. Yeah. Let's say she never waited for her brother. Or better, let's say it wasn't Miriam. Let's say it was Zundel, the son of Chaim Yankel, who was quarantined because he was a leper. Okay, forget Miriam. Well, let's say it wasn't Miriam. Rather, it was Dvasha. Chaya Dvasha, who was quarantined outside of the camp for seven days. They never waited for Moshe. There's no big story about them. They're not legends. A fine, ordinary man or woman, young or old, who was quarantined outside of the camp for seven days because of their condition. What does it sound like? What would have the nation do? Don't go. But because Miriam did something for Moshe, so God conferred upon her special honor. Now, I want to ask you, where were these Jews traveling? Where were they? They were in a desert, a barren, infertile desert. Yeah. Not a place of growth, no habitat, no civilization, not a place of rain, not a place of food. As Moshe would describe later in Deuteronomy, he called it a fearsome desert filled with snakes, scorpions, dangerous place, a hazardous place, no water, no food. The food that nurtured them, that nourished them was manna. The water that quenched their thirst was a rolling stone. A... <laughs> Quite literally, it was a rock. We call it Be'erish Miriam, the well of Miriam, also connected to Miriam, Be'erish Miriam. This wasn't a place where people lived. So I ask you a question. Not leaving Miriam behind is kavod? That's what you would call it? Kavod? Respect? Isn't there another word for it? What's the right word for it? <laughs> Saving her life. And if it wouldn't be Miriam, if it would be an ordinary Jew, we would just leave him. Sorry, have a good day. That doesn't have to do with Kavit. That's indirect murder. That's abandoning a person to the brutal forces of nature without protection. What does it have to do with Kavit? And what does it have to do with a special compensation for waiting for Moshe Rabbeinu? I would assume that any person that happened to 
if they couldn't leave for any reason, say there was a person who couldn't leave. So the nation would just say, Moshe would say, sorry, take care of yourself, bye-bye, three million Jews, we're leaving. Wahavdil just came to my mind. You know, elephants are very emotional, very emotional animals. You could see it, the display of their emotions, especially when there's a death of a calf or when there's a crisis in the herd. Sometimes there is a calf, a baby, that can't get stuck, for example, or is too ill to move on if it's a time of drought and there's not enough food or there's not enough water. And it's amazing sometimes to watch the videos of how the elephant herds will stick around as long as possible and sometimes forfeit their own safety, their own security, not to abandon this baby. I once saw a video somebody sent me. The whole herd left, but the mother, the mother could not leave. So the mother sacrificed her own life to be completely alone in a time of drought because she would not leave this baby calf, which ultimately did not survive during the brutal aridity that it endured. So this is even a trait of the animal kingdom. You know, herds take care of their own. They will do anything to defend their offspring, to defend one of their own. Here, we're not just talking about animals. We're talking about human beings. We're talking about Jews who were given the blueprint of the highest standards of morality, sensitivity, decency, and ethics. It's obvious that if a Jew is a leper, it's not a death sentence. Leprosy is a condition. It's a serious condition. He needs a cleansing, but it's not a death sentence. It's not a death sentence. Of course, you have to wait. So they would leave a Jew stranded in the Midbar and leave? Leave him? Of course not. Certainly not Miriam, but anybody. No difference. What is Rashi saying? Zah covered? Was it a special covered that they waited for a lady and they didn't let her die from, 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 from malnutrition, from hunger, from thirst, from uh, hydration, from exhaustion, from just being alone? And how is, he, how is she supposed to catch up for seven days? She's, she's going seven days behind without all the protection. So even if you're going to leave her some food and, 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 and water and then she has to catch up to everybody, this is not an issue of covered. This is an issue of basic preservation of life. We call it in Hebrew, Hatzalah's nefashas, saving a person's life. Is there something that we're not getting here? But it sounds like, no, this was a unique gesture not to let her die. You know why? Because she waited for Moshe. And if she wouldn't have waited for Moshe, we would let her die. Why are you calling this kavait? This question challenges us to delve into the story a little deeper, to be able to take it apart and see the deeper dynamics here at play, and then we can actually appreciate the panorama, the full panoramic picture of what Rashi and our sages are teaching us here in this, what seems like small story, but which carries a lot of weight and profound significance and relevant even to our daily life to relevance until today to our daily lives in our own contemporary times and milieu. The term that's used is, the Rebbeinu Shalom God tells Moshe, Tisager Shivas Yamim Mechutz Lamachana. She should remain seven days, she should be quarantined seven days, Mechutz Lamachana. The word is Machana. What does the word Machana mean, you know? Camp. <laughs> Right, the camps are called right. Machana this, machana that. But what does the word machan actually mean? Ah, huh? to rest, right? Like vayachanu. What's what's vayachanu? They rested. They dwelled in one place. When you're moving, you can't be called a machana, even if it's a large group that's moving. We happen to use machana as a euphemism for a group, for a camp. Like you'll say a machina, like in camp, they'll have color war, right? So you'll have a team, it's like a machina. A camp is a machina. But really the word camp is like encampment. When you remain, when you're fixed, when you're stationed in a single location, you're resting, you're called a machina. So even though we have it as a euphemism, for example, David HaMelech says in Tehillim, uh, in chapter 27, which we say in Elul, what does he say there? Uh, 
very good. Lo yira libi, right? If if a machana sits on me, if a machana comes and lands on me, which means a group of enemies, I will not be afraid. But the actual word machana, like the word choyna, what's choyna? Arrest, to dwell. Also associated with the word menucha, nach, vayonach, right? There's a similar etymology, there, even though it's not exactly, which is also rest. When you're in a stationary space. When people are moving, even if it's a group of people, you can't technically use the word machana. They're not resting, they're not dwelling, they're in motion, they're in movement. So when are the Jewish people called a machana? When they're stationary. When they're in a single place, that's when they're called a machana. It's not only a group, but it's a group that is resting, that is dwelling. They may move on tomorrow, but today they're in a state of chania, vayachanu. There's a famous pasuk, asher chana sham David, or b'makam asher choyne sham. If so, Hashem says Miriam should be quarantined seven days outside of the Machana. That means when the Jewish people are a Machana in one place. What if they're moving and she's in the back? (laughs) She's outside of the group. She's saying back, it doesn't count because they're not in a state of Machana. They have to dwell in one place for there to be a machina, so there could be mechutzla machina. When they're all in a state of motion, even if technically she's in the back, and she's disconnected, and she's moving alone, she's straddling along behind them, it's not a state of machina. So the seven days that Miriam was quarantined had to be during a time when the Jewish people could be called a machina, in other words, they were stationed in one place, and she's outside of that stationary camp. When those seven days pass, then... She comes back into the machana. If so, now we can understand this much, much better. Of course they wouldn't leave Miriam behind, whether she stayed for, behind for her brother or didn't. Just like they wouldn't leave Zundel Finkelstein behind. Just, just like they wouldn't, they wouldn't leave any other person, man or woman or child, young or old, behind. Obviously not. That's not a question. As I said, leprosy is not... A death sentence, heaven forbid. But what could have happened? There was a schedule of traveling. And this was a very, very uh, intricate schedule. We have in Baal Oizcha, Al pi Hashem Yisu, Al pi Hashem Yachanu. They didn't just decide to leave, you know, this is a good day for hiking. <laughs> the weather allows it. Talking about the weather, let's go hiking, let's move on. No, it was al pi Hashem Yisu, al pi Hashem Yachanu. The cloud rose into a vertical shape and the Jews knew it's time to move on. And then the cloud became like a horizontal, went into a horizontal shape rather than a vertical pillar. It was time to dwell. So there was a schedule during these 40 years where they went, how long they remained, and when it was time to move on. In Parshas Masse, the Torah goes through the 42 stations Vayisu, they traveled from one place, Vayachanu, Vayisu, Vayachanu, Vayisu, Vayachanu. And here again, you have constantly the word Vayachanu. They traveled and they rested. They traveled and they rested. They traveled and they rested. Ultimately, 42 locations during the 40 years. In some places, they were there for a short time. In some places, they were there for months. In some places, they were there for years. Of course, if they would have traveled in the middle of the time when there was a leper outside of the camp, they wouldn't have left him. He would have come along. And of course, Miriam would have come along. Her life wouldn't be in danger. But what would have happened? What would have happened is, for the seven days, it wouldn't count. So if Miriam became a leper, say, and for two days she's outside of the machina, but now it's time to travel. So what would happen? Miriam would travel with the Jews. But since they're not called machina, So the next five days of traveling are not counted as part of the seven days that she's michutz la machana because they're not a machana. So she's not outside of the machana. 
She's just part of the moving march. So what would have happened? Her life wouldn't be in danger, but what would have happened? Her condition would have been prolonged. What do you say? It would have been prolonged because she would have to wait, say, say, they would tra- say she was a leper for two days, so she's outside of the camp. Then they travel for a day. That day is not counted as one of the seven days. She would have to wait till they rest in the new place and then continue the last five days. So her agony of being in this difficult state would have been prolonged. Her life wouldn't have been in danger, but a state of agony would have been prolonged. Zakovit. So God made sure that the cloud, which he was guiding, because the Jews in the desert were following what was the original GPS, God's positioning system, or the original ways, the original ways, ways as in W-A-Z-E, of course. So HaKavit, Hashem said, no, no, no. We are staying put. We're not going anywhere for seven days. Even though, there may be a schedule. There may be destinations to hit. At this point, yeah, this point, the Jewish people are not even supposed to stay 40 years in the desert. This is before the story of the spies. At this point, they're supposed to go straight into Eretz Yisrael. This is before the whole debacle of the spies. This is only one year after the exodus of Egypt. In the month of Sivan, one year and two months after the exodus of Egypt, it's before the Miraglim, the spies were sent to Eretz Yisrael, so they weren't yet expecting a 40-year uh, delay in the desert. So there were deadlines to meet and schedules to, uh, to live up to. But Zeha Kavit Chalak Lahamakayim. Hashem gave a special gesture of respect that Miriam's agony and pain shouldn't endure even one superfluous moment, even one extra moment, even an extra hour, an extra day. How? By delaying the journey for seven days so she could remain mechutz la machane, outside of the machane, and complete what she has to complete and then come back in. Why did this happen to Miriam? Now we could see the correlation between what she did and what was done for her. Let's go back to that original story. Moshe Rabbeinu was placed in a basket in the river. Why? His mother knew, Yocheved knew, that if she leaves him in the house, there's no hope for this boy. The Egyptian troops, like the Gestapo, like the SS, came searching for every Jewish male born and cast them into the river. The Nile Delta, as you know, is a beautiful, beautiful river. It's the longest or the second to the longest river in the world. Thousands of miles. You know that the Nile travels through 11 countries. It's an extraordinarily beautiful river. Till today, a very, very attractive and appealing sight. For ancient Egypt, it was the, the gem of ancient Egypt. That's why they worshipped it. It was their god. It was their deity. It was also the source of their sustenance. No rainfalls in Egypt. And it was the Nile that literally, I don't know, but every August, as you know, every August the Nile would rise for thousands of years. The tides of the Niles would rise and saturate the soil and the earth of Egypt, travel into the mainland, and create a lush, living, and vibrant soil that produced extraordinary crop, extraordinary grain, fruits, vegetables, produce. The Nile became a home. It's still a home. Huge amounts of fish, famous crocodiles and alligators as well, and all types of amphibious creatures and, and water creatures submerged in the water, and it created the rich, and powerful economy of Egypt, besides being a source of papyrus and many other things that they can develop from the, from the, from the mud when the Nile came in. In the early 1900s, I think, at some point, they built a dam to block this uh, flooding of the Nile because naturally every summer the Nile would still rise. For thousands of years, this is how it worked. But under this bed of water, there was a dark secret. 
there was a dark secret. By day, the Egyptians would sit at the beach with beach chairs, and they would read newspapers with sunglasses. They would order pina coladas and lattes and iced coffees, and they would play ball and frisbee, and some would jog, and some had their headsets. And it was, it was a beautiful, beautiful sight, the sight of serenity and relaxation and delight. But in the middle of the night, it was a cemetery for Jewish babies, and the, the water eclipsed the cries. It covered up the crimes. So if you came to the Nile, it was so beautiful. But nobody knew the secrets that the Nile, the Nile contained with all the Jewish corpses, all the Jewish innocent babies that were thrown there. That's how you have to understand the story of the plagues, the story of Kriyas Yamsov. What the water turning into blood. What God is trying to do some puppet shows and magic tricks. The water is going to the water is going to become blood. Like, well, okay, we know you're a powerful guy. No, no, no. This was a lecture. The water becoming blood wasn't just a magic trick. It was a tutorial. What looks like fresh water is really blood. Your Nile, your vocations, your luxury are criminal acts. They're being done at the price of blood. And the same is true of the other plagues. The opening of the sea, the Kriyas Yamsuf, that swallowed up the Egyptians, was basically a reflection of what happened for decades when the Nile covered over all the dead bodies inside. Yocheved knew what the fate of little Moses is going to be. As a mother, she asked herself, what can I do under these circumstances? What would the basket help? So she takes her son, puts him in the river. What, what is he now supposed to do there? An Egyptian soldier will come. He's going to see a basket with a baby. What is he going to think? What is he going to think? A Jewish baby who puts a baby in a river. And what would he do? Flip it. Three months old Moshe. What was Yechevet thinking? And who's going to feed Moshe? He's three months old. Who's going to feed him? <laughs> she can't even put food in the casket. He's three months. He needs a mother to nurse him. What was she thinking? The answer, of course, is she thought to herself, listen, either I can let them take him and throw him into the river, but who knows, maybe a woman will walk by and maybe she'll have compassion for this baby. Who knows? Maybe, maybe there'll be a chance for survival. Maybe, I don't know, but it's the best thing I can do. To have some, some, what a mother would not do to save a child. Maybe, who knows? And that's what she does. She puts him in a basket and she leaves him there. Al Safa near the bank of the river, as it says in, a, in, a, in, a, in an agam, like in a marsh, covered by some bushes or, or trees, a marsh with some grass, some leaves, etc., at the bank of the Nile Delta. Miriam doesn't go home. Miriam is six years old. Six years old is not a big girl, a little girl. Now, Miriam was a bright little girl. She has already stood up to her father. <laughs> Because her father separated from their mother. Father didn't want to have more babies. Father said, what's the point? We have more babies. They'll just be killed. It's like the Jews after the Holocaust didn't want to have babies. A lot of them didn't want to get married. What's the point? Get married. Look what happened to the Jewish nation. You can understand them. Amram said, what? We're going to get married, have more babies just to see them die. Who needs this pain? Miriam stood up to her father and said, you're worse than Pari. Pari wants to kill the boys. You want to kill the girls too? Parai is a human being. His decree will, will die one day. Evil dies. But you're setting an example for the entire Jewish people to separate from their wives. Miriam, imagine a six-year-old convinced her parents to come back together. And Moshe was born as a result. So Miriam obviously had a special connection with this little boy. But three months later, as her little boy is cast into the river, and Amram was in despair, the Gemara says, that Amram came to his daughter Miriam, who was six years old, and putting his hand on her face, said, Miriam, Miriam, where is, where is your, great, your great promise that we're going to have babies and the decree will end? And well, she said, we'll have a baby who's going to save the Jewish people. It's a moment of despair. But Miriam stands. 
She doesn't stand close. I guess she doesn't want to arouse suspicion. She doesn't want to attract anybody there. She stands far away, but she can see. Ledea, to know Maye Asaloi, what's going to happen? Is she just a curious little girl? Is that what it's about? What did she think is going to happen? Now, if a soldier would have come, she would fight him? No. There was nothing she can do. If an Egyptian would come and do what Paroi said to do to every Jewish male, would she be able to save this boy? No, how could she? Both because of her age because of her strength, because of her position, and because of the nature of the Jewish people in the Egyptian empire, brutally subjugated under this genocidal pharaoh, under this genocidal plan of Pharaoh. But Miriam didn't ask, can I protect him? Will I save his life? Not. She wanted to see what's going to happen to her brother. She wanted to be there. How she can help, she didn't know. But she wanted to be there. I'm not going home. I want to be there. I want to do what I can. What can I? I don't know what I can. But if I go away, I certainly can't. (laughs) Here, I don't know how things are going to develop. You know, history, what do they say? History is stranger than fiction. Truth is stranger than fiction. We don't know what can happen. But I want to be present. What happens? An unlikely scenario. An Egyptian woman... Not a man, a woman, not even a Jew. Not only not a Jew, the daughter of the Pharaoh himself comes to bathe. She notices the casket, she retrieves it. And we all know the words, Vatishlach es Amasa. She sends her Amasa. Amasa literally means her maid. But the Chazal have a very interesting interpretation. You all remember it from school. That what? She stretched out her arm. Vatishlach es amasa. Nishtarviva amos yada amos harbe. Amasa comes the word ama, which is a size, a measurement. It's around a foot and a half or two feet. She stretched out her arm, but her arm can't reach the casket. So her arm extends many amos. It becomes much longer so she can reach the casket and take it. Now I want to ask you, why would the sages need to do this? (laughs) Like what's wrong with the story? (laughs) She came by, she came to bathe, she sent her maid, and her maid retrieved the casket, and everybody lived happily ever after. It's a beautiful story. She had compassion. Why do we need it now? Stretch, no! She stretched out her hand, and her hand became longer. Did you ever ask yourself this question? These are one of the questions you ask as a six-year-old and then you learn never to ask them again, right? (laughs) Why the need to impose this story? Like, What's wrong with the story itself? It's not heartwarming enough? And uh, daughters of Pharaoh, suddenly their hands become long? She went. (laughs) She saw a casket. She sent her maid. She opened it. She saw a baby crying. She said, it must be a Jewish baby. And she takes him as a child. What's better than such a story? Yocheved's vision, Yocheved's dream, her hope was fulfilled. Her baby was saved. But the sages felt the need to say her hand became long. So I'm going to teach you something today that I hope will allow you to understand not only this, but many other things that you have learned as children. The rabbis did not have an agenda, like some people think, to just create as many miracles as possible to entertain the kids and give you coloring books. So that you can have a coloring book with a long arm and you could make it orange and green and yellow and brown. They were guided always by one path, by one premise. It's called integrity. Every interpretation of the Chazal is driven and it's born from a nuanced, profound study and analysis of the text. In other words, the function of Medrash is to fill in the missing links, to fill in the gaps. They're trying to bring out, you know what it's like? A metaphor I once heard. 
There is playing piano, playing music, and then there's the harmony. There's the harmony, right? What do you have when you just have the ballad itself, the tune itself, without the harmony? You have the song, but you're missing the full grandeur of it, the full ecstasy of it. The harmony itself, without the notes of the actual song, won't give you the ballad, won't give you the song. But the song without the harmony will remain somewhat dry. The text of Teresh HaBiksav is the song. The Medrash is the harmony. It's like the singers will say, give me harmony. When they spoke about that hand becoming prolonged, they were saying something very, very profound. I stretch out my hand. It's not supposed to reach. <laughs> it's too far. It's not supposed to reach. So how did it reach? It reached because my hand stretched. There are situations in life where you try to do something that does not make sense. If you'll ask an expert, he'll tell you it's not going to work. Your arm can't reach that goal. You're wasting your time. If Batya would have consulted with a guru, a therapist, a coach, a teacher, a mentor, an advisor, a consultant, a life coach, a psychologist, a clinical therapist, her husband, her father, her brother, her uh, colleague, her partner, her employer, if she should do that, what would they tell her? Three words in Yiddish, what? The Bismashiga. It would be like Hitler having a daughter to go save a Jewish kid from the concentration camp and bring him, bring him to Burghoff to raise him in Hitler's house. He'll kill you and he'll kill the baby. That's a dreta. Stalin's daughter is going to go raid, bring in the enemy he's trying to murder and raise him under Paris. You're crazy. What are you going to... Okay, you, you feel bad for the baby. So now you're going to take him home to Paris? Brilliant move. You found out that he's a Jewish child and your father won't find out he's a Jewish child? Any voice of sanity would tell Batya to be sugar, you're crazy. This is not a feasible goal. Your arm could reach to a certain goal. It can't reach there. Give up your dreams. You're very idealistic. But idealism backfires. You got to be practical. You're defeating the purpose. You want to devise a plan long term? Okay. But if she would have listened to those expert voices, what would have happened? We know the end of the story. Certainly I would not be giving this class today. <laughs> That's one of, the, one of the ramifications. Another few ramifications too. But one of the ramifications a few thousand years later. But Batya knew that life doesn't work that way. All great, sometimes the greatest achievements happen by stretching out your arm to reach a goal that all the voices and all the experts in the world will tell you will never happen. But you know I have to stretch out my hand because there are forces beyond us that can take that arm and stretch it beyond your imagination and beyond your expectation. That's what the sages are teaching. This is the harmony behind the story. They're not imposing a new interpretation just to give us another miracle. There's not enough miracles in the Bible. Let's throw out another one. You thought ten plagues were dramatic enough? You thought the splitting of the sea is impressive? Let me tell you what else. Her hand became long. They're actually telling you the story. They're giving you the psychology. They're giving you the, the zeitgeist, the, the, the pneumius, the core of the story. They're giving you the harmony. You all know that now when you go back to the story, you're going to look at it in a different way because you heard the harmony. She, of course she stretched out her hand. But what was there behind stretching out the hand? You sometimes see a person stretching out their hand but you don't see what happened. You just saw an arm going out. But what was behind this arm going out? It was one of the most courageous moments where a person ignored 
all of the rational and sane voices which said, don't be stupid. And she said, no. There's something about this child I cannot ignore. And she took him in. Did she know how it's going to work out? Absolutely not. That's exactly the point. But she knew one thing. Leaving is not an option. You see, Miriam and her, they had a very deep similarity. Miriam stood there. Why are you standing, Medala? Go back home. It's late. It's supper time. Your father's going to be worried. What are you going to do? You're six years old. What are you going to do for this baby? Fight? They'll throw you into the river too. So now your parents will lose two children. God forbid. Miriam stayed there. And by the way, in parentheses, but not really in parentheses, you'll see here a fascinating truth that emerges. And here we see how things work together in Torah in an extraordinary fashion. What is the name of Moshe that we all know? We know one name, Moshe. Why? Who gave him that name? Batya. Why? Because I drew him out of water. Masha means to draw out. I took him out of the water. Now, Moshe, that's in Hebrew. She knew Hebrew. <laughs> so there's different interpretations. The Ezra says that she named him Moshe in Egyptian. And in Hebrew, it's translated as Moshe. Others actually say Moshe was an Egyptian. Is, is Moshe itself is rooted in an Egyptian name. The word itself was an Egyptian name. But here's the biggest question. When was he given this name? He was given this name a long time after he was born. But Moshe had a bris. He had a name. He had a name that his mother gave him, his father gave him. And we know the name. The Medrash records names that his father and mother gave him. I would think that should be the name. Not the name that a Gentile woman... The daughter of Pari gave him. She was a nice lady. She saved his life. But he also had a father and a mother. <laughs> Moshe wasn't an Egyptian kid. He was a Jewish boy. The Gemara Meseches Saita, page 13, records the names that they gave him. Batera, Oise, Ki, Toivu. Some say his name was Toiv. Beautiful name. What's wrong with the word Toiv? The name Toiv. Some say the name was Tuvia. The name Yekusiel. A lot of names at the Medrash in the beginning of Ayikra lists 10 possible names that Moshe had. Nobody knows them. <laughs> you have to look in the Medrash and you'll find those 10 names. Nobody knows them. Moshe, everybody knows. Not his natural name, not the name given by his parents, the name given by an Egyptian princess a long time after he was born. It could be it was given years after he was born because in the Torah it doesn't say she took him and she gave him a name. She raised him in the palace as her son, and she named him Moshe. It could be this name was given to him at the age of five or ten. In other words, for many years, he never had this name. It was an unnatural name. And yet, that's the name that was chosen. But now you'll see the pattern. Moshe grows up. He leaves the palace. He goes to see his brothers. What's the first thing he sees? An Egyptian beating a Jew to death. Okay, Moshe is the prince of Pharaoh's palace. He is a non-Jewish prince, quote unquote. It says Vayigdal Moshe. Moshe grew up. Vayetzei He went to his brothers. It's the second time Vayigdal. So Rashi tells us, first time it says he grew up is in terms of maturity. Second time he grew up means Minohu Paroi Albeisay. Paroi wasn't stupid. Pari was the most powerful person alive. He saw Moshe's skills. You look at a teenager and you could say, you're going to be the president of the United States of America. You all know, you look at certain children of yours and you're like, you're going to be a multimillionaire one day. It's not a question. <laughs> you're going to be an entrepreneur. You're going to have 10,000 employees under you. You could see it sometimes in a nine-year-old, how they speak, how they think. The Gemara says, Butzen, Butzen, Mekat Yediyah. From the conversations of little children, you could see a lot of their future. Certainly a man like Moshe, his brilliance, his genius, his skills. Pari saw it. He had to be dumb not to use it. So Rashi says he took Moshe and he made him the CEO of the palace. Not a biological child, not a biological grandchild. A kid who was adopted. But he became the boss. He became the man. He became the leader. Pari didn't do it to be nice. 
Paray do it, did it because he wanted success. He knew with Moshe, you can delegate the job and he will run the show and Paray could go sit by the Nile and sip his, uh, j- uh, his um, gin. He could go to his vacation houses by the Nile Delta. Moshe is good. After this, Moshe goes out, takes a stroll in the Jewish neighborhood, sees an Egyptian beating a Jew. What does Moshe do? Looks here, looks there, sees there's nobody there. What does, kills him, kills the murderer. He buries him in the sand. The Jewish slave is saved. The next day, of course, there was an informer, went to Parai. You're Moshe, murdered an Egyptian to save a Jew. What does Parai do? He realizes this boy can't be trusted. His heart is with the Jews. What does he do? He orders him to be executed. Moshe runs away to Midian, becomes a fugitive. From the CEO of Paro's palace, he's never a fugitive, a refugee. I want you to be rational with me for a moment, okay? You're Moshe. You're Paro's right-hand man. You grew up with him. He knows you, he likes you, he respects you, he appreciates you. He gave you a lot of power as a teenager. You now take a tour. You take a tour in the Warsaw Ghetto. A tour in Mauthausen. A tour in Bergen-Belsen. Together with the Red Cross. A tour in Buchenwald. And what do you see? You see an Egyptian or an SS beating a Jew who's about to die. You are, remember who you are, you're Pari's man. And you call up a great, brilliant diplomat and ask him, how should you respond? Your blood is boiling, you want to save that Jew. What do you think would be rational advice? Kill the Egyptian? Moshe, you know what's going to happen? You'll kill the Nazi. And your grandfather, Paroi, Eichmann, Himmler, Yemach Shemam, will say, oh, this, <laughs> out, you're done. Moshe, now you're dead. Moshe, be smart. Be smart. Shut your mouth. Let the Jew die. Don't say anything. Smile. And you know what happens next? You rise in power. You become more powerful, more powerful. In a few years, Pari is going to die. You know who has to take over? You. And you know what happens when you take over? The Jews are freed. That's what you do, Moshe. You're going to save a single Jew and jeopardize your whole glorious career that will liberate millions of slaves or hundreds of thousands of slaves. How short-sighted can you be? Remember the arm? You stretch out an arm, you have to have a goal, a feasible goal. Let me ask you another question, Moshe. How long do you think this Jewish slave is going to live? Let's say you kill the Egyptian. What's going to happen? Tomorrow somebody else could kill him. A month, a year. How long is he going to live for? So you imagine this scene. It's 1943. You are given tremendous power in the Third Reich. You can use it. One day you may be able to change the course of history if you play your game. What do you do? You kill one Nazi, you save a Jew for maybe a few hours, a few days, a few months, a few years, and now you lose everything, and now the last friend of the Jews is a fugitive. Does this make sense, my friends? Does this make sense? What would any politician, diplomat advise, Moshe? (laughs) You're not achieving anything. (laughs) You're making yourself feel good. But what did Moshe do? (laughs) He didn't do this. What did he do? He killed the Egyptian. Why? 
because he wasn't a politician, because he wasn't a diplomat, because he wasn't a strategic thinker. He was a diplomat, he was strategic, but above all, he was Moshe Rabbeinu. He saw an innocent person about to die. He didn't think about bureaucracy, about long-term pictures, long, the long-term picture, how I'm going to rise in my career. Right now, there's a person about to die. I can either become part of the solution or part of the problem. I can either stand up to evil or become an accomplice of evil. I can either fight and protect this person or I could say, no, let me play nice guy. Let me play Egyptian. I'll have more influence. One day they'll invite me to become a board member. And when I become a board member, I'll become the chairman of the board. And in seven years, I'll change the system from within. And then many more children will be saved. <laughs> That's not Jewish. What made Moshe Moshe was... He saw an innocent child being abused and he stood up and he said, not on my watch. And what happens? He loses everything. He becomes a refugee. He becomes a fugitive. But something else also happens. He meets his wife. He meets God. He ultimately saves the Jewish people. Because of that. Because of that. Where did Moshe learn this from? His name is Moshe. What's Moshe? Drawn out of water. Why did Batya draw him out of water? Batya also wasn't thinking. Nobody's thinking. <laughs> if Batya would have thought long term, Batya, forget this kid. Let him die. Go home. Get your father into therapy. Some yoga. Some Pilates. We'll teach him some democracy. We'll teach him human rights. After 10 years, Pyro will become a mensch. And you'll know, that's how you think. That's not what she did. She stretched out her arm to do the impossible. What did General Montgomery say? The, immediate, the, the difficult we do immediately, the impossible takes a little longer. <laughs> but Basi said, even the impossible we do right now. My father, my late father, Zechariah Levracha, described to me a scene that remains etched in my memory. It's not just a particular story, it's a perspective. Those of you who know Brooklyn a little bit, there are the famous Brooklyn Botanical Gardens on Eastern Parkway, near the library, near Prospect Park. They're beautiful, beautiful gardens. In the 1940s and 50s, the Crown Heights neighborhood, all the way from Bronzeville to Bedford-Stuyvesant, you know, was all Jewish, mostly secular Jews. The largest conservative temple in the United States of America was called the Brooklyn Jewish Center, 667 Eastern Parkway, which had a major gym and a major pool. Today it's a yeshiva called the Holy Torah. Cantor to Coward, some of the great cantors were there. Eastern Parkway, it's still a, a nice building, beautiful building, not exactly the same, but you could still see the residue, the imprints of the old, of the days of yore. In 1940, and ultimately the Skulene Rebbe settled there, the Babavir Rebbe settled there, there were a lot of shuls there of Hutner, Yubitsa Kutner built his koilo there, Gorari. Then there was a mass migration from that area, as everybody knows. Borough Park, Long Island, suburbs, other place. As the community became a little uh, diverse. And at that point, in 1940, running away from Nazi occupied Warsaw, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson, settled in Crown Heights, 770 Eastern Parkway. There was no Tashlich there. There was no pond or river or brook. It's not like in Muncie, you have homes with ponds, you have lakes with the ducks and the deer running around. It's Brooklyn. And it's before the days that, you know, they can afford building their own ponds and rivers and brooks and digging for wells. So Rosh Hashanah, the Hasidim would walk 
to Brooklyn Botanical Gardens where there's a beautiful, beautiful lake with a lot of fish for Tashlich. So my father described to me it was a beautiful scene because all the way till Bedford Stuy was all Jews, mostly secular. They would sit Rosh Hashanah on the island of Eastern Parkway, you know, the middle island over there. Every Shabbos, there were 10, 20,000 Jews sitting there because it was far Shabbos even if they didn't keep Shabbos. This is the early days of America, you know, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. Things have changed since. And, uh, and there would be like this parade of Hasidim who would go do Tashlich, and it was a very interesting scene. One Rosh Hashanah, it was Rosh Hashanah, I think, Tov Shin Yud in 1956. The Lubavitcher Rebbe would always lead this uh, procession, and hundreds of people, whoever wanted, would follow him to Tashlich. There was one thing, that Rosh Hashanah in the afternoon, it was pouring rain. But not just pouring like this. You know, pouring that which reminds you of Katrina and tsunamis and Noyach's floods. You know those rains that if you go out for like three seconds, it's like you've been in a pool for three days. It was one of those downpours that were incredibly powerful. The Rebbe, who was already not such a young person, comes to the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens. The guard <laughs> didn't think that anybody in their right mind is going to be visiting the Botanical Gardens on this lovely afternoon because you couldn't walk outside. So he decided it's a good day to take off early. <laughs> and he closed the gates, very tall gates, <laughs> and he went home. So now the Lubavitcher Rebbe comes to the gates <laughs> and they're closed he looks, there's nobody to talk to. But the Tashlich is there. And soon is going to be the end of the day of Rosh Hashanah. Jews have a minute to do Tashlich. So the, so the Rebbe, spontaneously, he gave his siddha to somebody. And he started to climb. <laughs> and my father told me the way he climbed. He started to climb. With simplicity. No fanfare, no drama. Like a real athlete climbed. Flipped over. Climb down. Now there were Hasidim there in their 70s and in their 80s and even higher. But they see the Rebbe doing this. Everybody climbed over. Everybody, hundreds of people climbed over. <laughs> they set Tashlich <laughs> and they went back. They went back to Shul. In life, when you have a conviction, when you know who you are, you know what your purpose is, Closed gates don't stop you. If you ask somebody, it says your arm won't get there. But this is what inculcates in a generation a way of looking at the world. When you know your goal, you know your destination, you become unstoppable. Melech pirates gather, the Gemara says. A king breaks through boundaries. That's what Moshe learned from his stepmother, from his sister. His name is Moshe to always remind him who he is. He is the kid who was drawn out of the water. Unnaturally, he should have died. If she would have thought over what she was doing, he would have died. But she didn't. She saved him. That became his name. It became his identity. Now, years later, there's a Jew dying. He could have also said, nah, nah, nah. Let's think this through. One day, I'll lead this nation. I'll save, not one. I'll save 600,000. He didn't. He killed the murderer. He saved the Jew. He became a refugee, and he didn't regret it. Because his name was Moshe. Batya retrieves the child. He's weeping. She understands. He's hungry. He's been in a casket. For whatever he was, alone, abandoned, neglected. He's not in mommy's arms anymore. He's a hungry boy. What's to see now? Miriam knows this is why she's here. She runs over to Batya and says, Should I go and summon a Jewish woman to be a net wet nurse to nurse this baby? And what does the daughter of Pharaoh say? Lichi, go. She goes, she calls the mother of Moshe, she nurses her baby, and Moshe calms down. Now let's ask a question. What if Miriam would have not been there? 
If Miriam would have not been there, what would have happened? Batu would take the baby. He's weeping. He's crying. She would have to find a wet nurse. What would have happened? She wanted this child. She didn't want to let him die. If she wanted to let him die, she could have tipped the casket or just left it. She wanted to save the boy. So what would have she done ultimately? What do you think? She would have found a wet nurse. Now Chazal tell us that this wasn't a simple story. Why did she agree to Miriam's gesture? What are you mixing in? The answer is, she had plenty of wet nurses. (laughs) She was the princess. She had plenty of people. But Moshe refused to take in their milk. Okay, I'm glad I don't have to climb this tent. You see how heaven listens to my lectures? A few minutes late, but that's not so bad. In a video, it's always a few minutes late. (laughs) You have to speak louder. You got to compete with God's reign now. Gishme brocha. Reigns of blessings. I'm sorry, what? Oh. I don't know. I don't know. But certainly she could find a wet nurse in Egypt. So our sages again give us the harmony. And they say she found. But Moshe refused. So Miriam said maybe he needs a Yiddish (laughs) mama. He needs Jewish lactose training. They go to all the the Jewish mothers, you know. They go for all these mices, for all these training. They know. And they know about the nutrients in the milk. (laughs) They're, they're experts. So Bat, Batya said, go. So Miriam brings the mother. Now I want to ask you, did Batya know that Miriam brought her mother? <laughs> what do you think? What would have you suspected? There's a little girl who shows up. Should I bring you a Jewish woman? Come on, you wouldn't suspect that there's a plot here? I would argue, of course she knew. And that's exactly how she wanted it to be. It was a perfect arrangement that didn't arouse suspicion. There's a wet nurse coming to the palace every day, happens to be a Jewish woman. This was part of her kindness. She didn't only save the baby. She allowed the baby to be raised by its mother without triggering the suspicion of her father and causing the murder of this baby. But of course, the Torah wouldn't say it because... We don't say it. It was clandestine. You have to understand the way the Torah was written always reflects the story. If part of the story couldn't be said, it would never be written. What's written is only that which could be articulated. That which has to say, shh, remains, shh. You have to infer it. You have to figure it out. But let's say Miriam was not there. Batu was no fool. She had motherly feminine instincts. She saw, he's not nursing, let's get an expert. Maybe he needs a Jew. He's a Jewish kid. What would have she done? She would have sent a messenger, bring me a Jewish mother, and Moshe would nurse. But what would have happened then? Would Moshe die? No. Miriam didn't save Moshe's life. She would have found a nurse to nourish Moshe. But what would have been the result? No. Moshe wouldn't die. But what would have happened if Miriam was not there? His agony would have been prolonged. His pain would have been prolonged. That was Miriam's contribution. Moshe was saved by Batya, but because of her presence, his agony was brief. Because she immediately ran to mommy and brought her in, and Moshe could be soothed both physically and emotionally. This happened when she was six. When the Jews left Egypt, Moshe was 80. She was 86. Now forward the tape recorder of history for 80 years. Moshe was now a big boy. (laughs) He was a growing up. He wasn't only a growing up. He was 80 years. He was the Jewish leader. 
He liberated them from oppression. He emancipated his people. He overthrew the Egyptian empire. He revolted against his own Zayda. People don't realize that. He overthrew the empire. And as God's ambassador, changed the world. In fact, every revolution of slaves, I don't know if you know, almost every revolution of slaves till today, which story do they gain inspiration from? The exodus of Egypt. When the black slaves in America and the South were struggling, the most important story in their literature, in their songs, in their poems, was Moses confronting Pharaoh in a story that eerily reflected theirs and their torture that they had as slaves being lynched, abused, oppressed, etc. But not just that movement. T countless movements of freedom. Moshe is the leader, he's the man. The man who was taken out of water. Eighty years have passed since that frightful day when he was abandoned in a casket and six-year-old Miriam stood there. Eighty years have passed. He is 80. She's 86. They have left Egypt. And now one more year has passed. She's 87 or so. He's 81. And she's suffering from a leprosy. And God says she should be quarantined for seven days outside of the camp. But there's a traveling schedule. Hashem has a traveling schedule. They have to get into Eretz Yisrael. If they would continue to travel, Miriam wouldn't die. Of course not. Miriam would travel with the Jews, perhaps behind the line or in the middle. But what would be? She wouldn't have her seven days outside of the Machina. She would have to wait till they come. And that means her condition would be prolonged. So what does Hashem do? Hakavoid chalak lahamakan. There's a special gesture that belongs to Miriam. That God gives her. What is the covet chalak la hamokayim? Bishvil shah achas shenis akva kishahushlach la ya'ayr. Because of her presence, she didn't go anywhere. She stayed. Did she know what she's going to accomplish? She couldn't have known. But she said, I'm staying. I'm not going anywhere. I have to be present. She remained in one place. Stationed. In a form of self-imposed exile. Well, not exile in the classical term, but in the sense, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to watch. And indeed, what does she achieve? Her baby brother cries much less. Instead of crying for six hours, eight hours, ten hours, instead of going the day or the night hungry, she ensures that he's soothed as soon as possible. That moment nobody witnessed. Moshe was three months. She was six. Batya was a stranger. But God witnessed it. As he witnesses everything that a person does. So 80 years later, eight decades later, it's not one baby and one little girl. Now there's four million Jews. It's not one baby and one girl. There's four million Jews, including the greatest of the great. Moshe, Aaron, his children, the Sanhedrin, the leaders, the Nesim, the great men, the great women, prophets, 72 prophets. At the end of Baal Yisrael, we have dozens of new prophets. And all of Klal Yisrael. Now, you know, a gathering of four million people in a desert is not simple to maintain. Running a shul of 300 members is not simple. Running a community of 500 people is not simple. A community of 4 million Jews? Who? Quite complicated, quite difficult. And yet, Miriam is now going through her own difficult process. So what does God say? All of the Jewish people now wait. Everybody waits. As Miriam waited for that little baby, 80 years later, millions of people wait for her. Her life is not in danger, but that her agony, her pain, should not be prolonged. Exactly what she did for Moshe. That same respect 
that same sensitivity is conferred upon her. Sometimes in our own lives, there is a child. We may not know exactly how to help, how to save, how to transform things. We also may look at ourselves in terms of a six-year-old, in terms of prowess or power or know-how or skill. But we always have a choice. We could say goodbye or we could just stand and be present. Every child in the world deserves to have a Miriam, an older sister, or whatever that represents, to stand and look out for that child. Every child deserves to have that person. And every person ought to feel the privilege to be such a person for a child. There's a child in years, and there's sometimes a child in terms of spiritual or emotional, psychological development and confidence. There's different types of children. There are children of all ages in the world. And in one sense, we're all children. Even if we become older, we still have that inner child. And knowing that there is a Miriam, who may be far away, but stands there with one objective, look out for you, makes all the difference to that child. I have to ask myself, when that opportunity comes to me in my family or in my community or in my sphere of influence, what do I do? Do I say there are bigger and better? I'm six years old. I'm just a small person. Or like Miriam, I stand there. And I may not be able to change much, but as it turns out, I can minimize your agony just a little bit. I can soothe you just a little bit. I can help you dry your tears just a few hours earlier. I may not see it as very significant or valuable. I may just see it as a nice gesture, part of the duties of fellow human beings. But God sees it otherwise. And in eight decades, that one gesture that just lasted for one hour is not just quadrupled. Suddenly it's morphed in the same gesture by millions and millions of people. And everybody asked the question, why are we waiting? What are the kids doing camp? Why? You forgot. Why are we waiting? <laughs> oh, because 80 years ago, there was a little child and somebody waited. So all of the Jewish people now sit seven days like this. You know what happens when millions of Jews sit like this? And they all had seven days to reflect on that truth. That ultimately, all of history can be transformed by the courage of one little girl who may not figure out the solution to all of the world's problems, but does figure out her responsibility to stand, to wait, to be present, to be alert, and to look out for that child, Ledea to know Maye Asaloi. What is going to happen to him? Now, I got an email on Sunday or yesterday. Somebody sent me a friend from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. His name is Dr. Melnick. He's a friend of mine. And he sent me an email. It was a story that he read or heard from uh, a Jew who lives in California. He's an author. His name is David Wolper. Or by David Wolper. And this is the story he relates to me. And it touched me. I guess he sent it in honor of Father's Day. It says, My father's father died when my father was 11 years old. His mother became a widow at the age of 34. And he, my father, was an only child. So he bore much of the grief alone. No siblings, no larger family. He grieved for his father alone. They were traditional Jews. So he began to walk every single morning, early in the morning to Shul, in order to daven Shachris and say Kaddish for his father. A practice that he continued for a whole year, 11 months after his father's death, at the age of 11. Every day he walked to Shul 
to say Kaddish for his father. At the end of the first week, he noticed that every time he was walking out of his house to walk to shul very early in the morning, he bumped in to somebody who had a job in the shul. He was known as the ritual director of the synagogue. His name happened to be Mr. Einstein. And as this little boy came out of the house, he always bumped into him. He was always also walking to shul. So, oh. so Mr. Einstein, who was already uh, advanced in his years, after a few days, the boy says, what are you doing here? He says, your home is on my way to shul. When I walk to shul, your home is on the way. So I thought, I'm an older guy. I'm looking for fun. <laughs> I need entertainment. I think it would be fun if I have some company walking to shul. It's not so boring. That way I don't have to walk alone. I have some company. So that's why I decided to come meet you when you walk out and we'll walk together. And this Jew, David Wolper, says, for a whole year, my 11-year-old father and Mr. Einstein walked through the New England seasons. And if you ever endure the New England seasons, you know there's the humidity of summer, and it's humid, and there are the snowstorms of winter. For a year, they walked, and it was a nice walk, so they talked. They talked about life, they talked about loss, they talked about hope, they, talk about, they spoke about rebirth, they spoke about navigating the vicissitudes and challenges of life, and old Mr. Einstein got to listen and to share with this 11-year-old who for a full year was not alone anymore. And David says his parents got married and his first son was born. David Wolpe's older brother was born. And my father remembered Mr. Einstein. Mr. Einstein was now a Jew in his high 90s. Because when he was 11, he was already an old man. Now he was married with his first son. And he was already in his 90s. So he calls Mr. Einstein and he says, I had a baby. And I would love if you can come see our new child, I want you to meet my wife. You never met my wife. I want you to meet my child. Mr. Einstein said, I would love to meet your wife and child, but you know, I'm no spring chicken anymore. I'm no youngster. It's a little hard for me to get out and move around, so I would need you to come to me. I'll be happy to come to you, but it's very hard. Bring your wife and child and come to me. So he says, where do you live? <laughs> so the man gives him the address. He says, this is my house forever. This is where I always lived. So I was never in your house. This is the house. This is the address. Come with your baby. And then the father, this person, writes, I quote, The journey by car was long and complicated. His home by car was more than 20 minutes away. And suddenly, as a married man with a child, I broke out sobbing as I realized what he had done as an old man for a full year. He walked every morning for hours to be by my home as I walked out so that I, the orphan, would not have to be alone each morning. By the simplest of gestures, the act of caring, he took a frightened child and he led him with confidence and faith back into life. Have a wonderful week. As far as your question, the word Amasa, it says that the daughter of Parai, Vatishlach es Amasa, she sent Amasa. So the literal interpretation, Rashi brings it from the Gemara, is her maid, like, like a shifcha, is called Amma, right? An Amma, Amasa is her maid, her her shifcha, her maid. But then there's another interpretation, and that is actually refers to her arm, like from the elbow, from the elbow, till the end of the middle finger, till the tip of the middle finger is called the ama. The ama, from the elbow till the end, till the tip of the middle finger. So batish leches amasa would mean her, her arm. She sent forth her arm. But as Rashi puts it, that 
should have had a, what's called a dogesh mem, a mem dogesh, like a pintala, a point in the mem. Vatishlechesa mosa, vatikachayu. Amasa is written without that. So therefore the Chazal interpret it also from the word Amma, Amasa, Amais. In other words, that the Amma, the arm, right, extended into many, many Amais. It became, usually it's an Amma. An Amma is around a foot and a half. Why is it called an Amma? Why do we call an Amma an Amma? You know, an Amma is around a foot and a half or two feet because that's basically the length from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger. So we call that an Amma. So what Tishlech HaSamasa would mean that that arm extended many Amais. Nishtar Vav Amas Harbi. This is a second interpretation in Gemara. It's in Shraktate Saita, I think page 12 or page 13. And Rashi brings it in Chumash. So this second interpretation of the Chazal, we're explaining that's, 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 that's the harmony of the story. Whether, whether it's her arm, whether it's the maid, but the idea was that this is something that's unreachable. It's something beyond beyond the reach. So when she when she sees Moshe, this child is not in her reach. Of course, physically he's in her reach. He, she can go get him. But is this something you can accomplish? Is this is this something you can reach? <laughs> you're you're going to raise him in the palace, yeah. right? What? So why the name Moshe? So that was the whole point. The reason the Torah chooses the name Moshe is because it's the Egyptian name. It's the name given by the Egyptian princess. It's not the Jewish name. It's the Egyptian name. And that brings out who Moshe is. He's an Egyptian prince, meaning he has the potential to one day become the monarch or become one of the most powerful people in Egypt. Moshe represents who this person really was because that gives us perspective on the sacrifice the moment that he'd, he'd killed that Egyptian. Moshe basically sacrificed all of his dreams, all of his potentials. If we would call him Toiv or Tovya, we wouldn't get this message. The Torah is trying to tell us, remember who Moshe is? Moshe has an Egyptian name because he's growing up in an Egyptian palace as an Egyptian prince. And therefore the natural thing for him to do was stay put, be silent, abstain from killing the Egyptian, and one day you'll be able to take over the empire. And this represents his true greatness. He did not remain silent. He could not remain indifferent as an innocent Jew was being, was being killed. And point number two, of course, is that the very name reminds him what happened to him. Every moment of the day when Moshe thought about who he is, he is the boy who was drawn out of water. In other words, he was about to die. And somebody came, a woman came, and sacrificed her life in order to retrieve him from the water. This is his name, this is his identity, and therefore this is what he does for others. What was done for him at that moment, he does for others. When he was in that basket that his mother made for him, she came and sacrificed everything and took him out. This is what Marshall do for others, right? That explanation. In terms of, in terms of Miriam, well, what, what could she hope to do there? She's six or seven years old. What is she supposed to do? <laughs> if an Egyptian comes and, and, and takes the child, what, she's going to abduct the boy? She can't. If, if, if an Egyptian comes and throws him into the Nile, what is she going to do? Save him? She can't. And if the, if the basket capsizes, if it turns over and he falls out, you know, she's far away. She's not a foot away. She's far away. <laughs> so who even knows if she'll be able to save him? What she does accomplish is she minimizes his agony. His hunger pangs are lessened because of her. That's the one thing she accomplishes. And that's exactly what she is rewarded with. Her agony, her agony is minimized. Because if, if they wouldn't have waited, she would have traveled. She would have traveled. But that means she would have to be quarantined for longer. Because during the journey, she would be in the back and then she would have to have those full seven days outside of the machana. So what that, what that means is her agony would, would be continued. She would have to deal with this skin disease for a longer time, and she would have to, have to deal with the, the being quarantined and isolated for a longer time. So it's this pain, the skin pain or whatever it is, the emotional pain, the physical pain that was taken away from Miriam. This was the special covid that was given to Miriam. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. 
please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.